Welcome to First Saturday. This is Bruce C.E. Fleming, Executive Director of the True 316 Foundation. Our website's true316.com. That's T-R-U-316.com. And we like to get together on the first Saturday of every month. And this month, we're going to take a look at something related to the Lausanne Congress on World Evangelization. The first one was in Lausanne, Switzerland in 1974. And since then, there's been one in Manila, one in Cape Town, and now one in Seoul, South Korea. And uh, as that was going on, it made me think about the uh, program director of the very first Lausanne Congress on World Evangelization. His name was Paul E. Little, professor of mine. And uh, at one point, he said to us, the students, we were in a small group every week. We got together and he led it. it was a fantastic time with him. I really really like that. And he also taught us a course on on uh, evangelism, various. He had something like 30 different lessons, and he taught us 30 different ways to uh, share the gospel. Um, but then he said, we're, I'm going to be gone for the next year. I'll be in Lausanne, Switzerland, putting together the program for the International Congress on World Evangelization. That eventually turned into the Green Book, which is this, this uh, 500 and some, I don't know, maybe more than that. It's a lot of pages. Oh, yeah, it's more than a thousand. So this is the, uh, the let let the earth hear his voice, and it was put together by the uh, the Congress in 1975. So the official reference volume, and it has oh 1,471 pages, and in the middle of that uh, happens to be a report where I was privileged to be the secretary, and it was the uh, the authority and uniqueness of Scripture report from Study Group A. Anyhow, I knew a lot about Paul Little, and in his book, How to Give Away Your Faith, he talked about how the woman at the well was approached by Jesus, who shared his faith, and he showed that there were eight different steps on how he gave away the faith, led the woman to come to knowledge in him. And I thought, you know, those eight steps that uh, Jesus used are fantastic and wonderful if we want to share our faith. But they're also appropriate if we want to share the good news of the gospel from the Garden of Eden. So what I'd like to do today is to go over the, the eight steps that Paul Little put together in his book, How to Give Away Your Faith, and then we'll also take a look at uh, how and think about how that might work. Now, I've got a special guest with me today, Luce Tam from the UK. So, Luce, you're going to be with me. We'll talk about this as we go along, if you'd like, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to shift to... The screen, we're going to go right over here to, oh, that looks like veggie tails. That's not what I want. <laughs> not, you can tell that the grandchildren yes. have been, been in the house. Let's try <laughs> this one. <laughs> there we go. All right. So this is chapter three from his book. And um, he's going to talk about how to witness. And when he talks about how to witness, maybe the best way to do it is to follow Jesus' own example. So the first thing that Jesus did is when he's met the woman at the well in Sychar, Samaria, the disciples went into the town to get food and water while well, there was water at the well, and Jesus stayed there at the well. It's interesting why he stayed there at the well. Did he know she was going to be coming by? So number one principle is to contact others socially. If we would like to share the good news of the Garden of Eden, uh, let me tell you what that is. Let's summarize. In the book of Eden, we talk about Genesis chapters 2 and 3. And in the banner at the bottom, we have a little summary of what that is. So, Luce, do you know what that, can you read that from there? God didn't curse Eve or Adam or limit woman in any way. So how do you summarize an entire Genesis 2 and 3 in one little sentence? <laughs> so we tried, we tried to do it that way. And I think it works. God didn't curse Eve or Adam or limit women in any way. So how do we share this good news? Well, we could buy a book and we could, we could say, you know, here, read this book. That might work. But we can also follow these eight steps. So I want to do that. So first is contact others socially. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea, and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. Actually, he didn't have to go through Samaria. Normally, you would go to Jerusalem, back up to Galilee, by going over to the, down the, down the mountains, 
to the coast of the sea of of the mediterranean sea then you'd work your way up the coast then you would cut back and get into galilee if you there is an overland route but you would right go through all of the samaritans and people didn't want to go there they had a mixed religious system and they they were kind of like almost untouchables so you wouldn't go through that but jesus had to go through samaria why i think it's because this was the person that he wanted to talk to so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. We can talk about why she was coming in the middle of the day. That's not the normal time you come to get the water. So this was a very carefully scripted, specific time to meet this one person. So principle number one I relate to something I learned when I was first being trained by youth leaders when I was in high school. And they said, when it comes to contacting others socially, pray that the Lord will bring to mind a specific person. And because I was in high school, they had a nifty little saying. They said, ask the Lord to help you pick a target teen. <laughs> okay, target <laughs> teen. Well, okay, now if, maybe you're not a teenager or you can you know, pick a target teen. But the idea is, not only I'm just going to contact others socially, throw out a big net and kind of be vague. No, no. Ask the Lord to tell you who's a specific person that you can talk to about the good news about Jesus. And in this case, who's a specific person you can talk to about the uh, the True 316 insights, the good news from the gospel in the Garden of Eden, that God didn't curse Eve or Adam or limit woman in any way, and all the good news that's related to that. So if we're going to contact somebody socially, who? Ask the Lord to bring to mind one. Start with one. Maybe a couple others after that. Who are you going to talk to? That's the principle number one. Number two, establish common ground. I'll read a little bit here. The second principle builds on the first. We must take time to establish common ground as a bridge for communication. So how did he build a bridge of communication with the woman at the well? What was it that they shared in common? I'm going to pop this question on you, Luz. What did Jesus and the woman at the well talk about? Water. Yeah, talked about water. We're at a well. So we talk about water. Yeah, and I'll, something people always like to talk about is the weather, you know, so uh -huh. <laughs> whoever you're with, you can talk about the weather. So you establish common ground, you know, hey, what'd you think about the game, you know, that last week or whatever, there's there's just different things. Or what are you having for supper tonight or depending on what you want to do. So you establish common ground. Uh, Paul Little had a had a good example. He he would He would share who he was and what he did. Uh, it was really nice. Now, he says, if I had been Jesus Christ, Lord of the universe, I probably would have blurted out to the woman at the very beginning, lady, do you know who I am? <laughs> but Jesus didn't approach her that way. He began by making a request. Would she draw him some water? Well, he was at the well. So it made, made sense. Yeah. That, you know, that would be the topic. And, um, and he had been traveling. So... He, would, he was in need of some water. Now, this, is, I, an this is an interesting well because it's not a, mm -hmm. it doesn't, have, doesn't have a pump handle. It, this well is, I've been there, I've seen it, and uh, it's very deep. It's not something you reach down and, you know, get some water. It's way down there. And so you have to be prepared to get the water up out of there. And so Jesus isn't prepared. He's just there. He's thirsty. Yeah, I think... I think he woke up that morning and prayed for his assignment that morning, that day. And the Lord put it on his heart to go there. That's my view. Yeah, okay? yeah. There's a special woman and she will be there at that time. So if you if you set off at 8 o'clock in the morning, you'll get there in time and she will be there waiting for you. You don't know that yet. She doesn't know that yet, but you know. And yep. uh, that's what happened. Yeah. That's right. So step number three, then, is uh, related to the first two, and that is arouse interest. So Jesus answered her and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, he didn't impose it and didn't say, hey, I'm this. No, he says, if you knew who it is, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. 
Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. And by the way, now we have a whole question. What's living water? See? Mm -hmm. So she, she's thinking water and he's thinking spirit. And so finally she says, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Well, that's a quite of a miracle. I mean, she's really stepping out on faith, but she's still talking water. And so you're going to find that when you're talking to people, you you can't expect right away that they're going to say, oh, all those good things that you learned about the Garden of Eden, I, I get it right away. No, they don't. Mm -hmm. No. You can say, have you ever heard of the Garden of Eden? Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, have you uh, have you ever noticed some people have one point of view on the Garden of Eden and other people might have another point of view on the Garden of Eden? Have you ever noticed how maybe... We need to double check to see what really happened in the Garden of Eden. I mean, the Bible tells us, but have we paid attention to that recently? Let's take a look. Because you can say something that interests them. So, for example, what I try to do is I say, did you know that some years ago there was a river that caught on fire? And in the Garden of Eden passage, there are some verses that have been caught that have caught on fire. And like, what do you mean, catch on fire? See, so I'll say, well, the river, the real river caught on fire because there was oily pollution on top that caught on fire. And the verses in Genesis 3, especially catch on fire because there's been some mistranslation that's been done. And then you can just sort of see what happens if the conversation goes a little farther. By the way, Paul Little, well, I'm jumping ahead. I'll, let's see if he talks about it. So you get the ball rolling, number four. He made a cryptic statement, and she said, you know, are you, are you greater than our father Jacob? Well, that's interesting. So the Samaritans, they had a mix-up of, of the Jewish revelation, but then they had, they had been brought in from other countries and settled in the area, and they had brought their pagan views, and it was, it was mixed. But they had a few good concepts. They understood that Jacob was important and God had talked to Jacob and Jacob's ladder was somewhere in their Samaritan territory. And, and so, are you greater than our father Jacob is a good question. She's saying to him, do you have some spiritual insights that I might learn from you? So we try to do that. Now, Paul Little, when he's sharing his faith He'll get to this point and he'll say, by the way, are you interested in spiritual things? Some will answer yes, some will answer no, but you can still proceed if you're going to share your faith. You say, what do you think a real Christian is? And then as you go farther at the bottom of the screen here, it says, would you like to become a real Christian now? So you take them step by step. You just go with them a little bit at a time. By the way, are you interested in spiritual things? What do you think a real Christian is? Would you like to become a real Christian now? So we can do that kind of thing. We can say, by the way, are you interested in Bible trans how Bible translation works? Do you think that there might be some disagreement among translators? Would you like to know what the Hebrew words say in Genesis chapter 3? Okay, now we're, we're just, you know, we're slowly bringing them along. And then people would say right away, well, what, what Bible translation is the right one? And you can say, well, there's, you know, there's more than 50 major translations in English. <laughs> so, and there are multiple ones in a lot of languages. And uh, they, they write them different translations for different reasons. But in Genesis 3.16, I personally say this, in Genesis 3.16, the King James Version helps us see maybe more clearly what the Hebrew words behind it say. Like, oh, what King James, huh? So we can we can get talking about that. Next step, don't go too far. So back when Paul Little wrote this book was at the end of a period of time in the United States when people were hitchhiking. Uh in the in the in the early and middle 20th century, people hitchhiked all the time. And then when I was there, when I got to know him in the 70s, they weren't doing that too much. It wasn't always safe. You weren't it just, that was kind of not done so much. But he talked about 
he talked about the principle of hitchhiking. If you're driving, you've got a car and you're driving down the road and you see somebody with their thumb out, that was a sing signal I'd like to snag a ride. So you you come over, so you're there at their point, you're on your trip, but they are at a certain starting point where they are. They get in your car, then you go down the road, you can talk to them now, share your faith about Jesus, but at a certain point, now you know where you're going, but they have a thing where they want to get off. And so you say, no, no, you got to go all the way with me. <laughs> do, you, do you think the hitchhiker would be happy about that? You know, they, they have something in mind. They have an interest that ends at a certain point. They say, I'd like to get off here. So Paul said, you're polite. Don't go too far. You let them off. Now, maybe next week when you're driving down the road, you might see them at that farther point and they might want to go even farther with you. So you can. He said, it's not our job to do everything in the procedure of leading people to Christ. It's our job to take them where they are and to take them farther. And to know how to go all the way to the end if we need to, and we want to, and even beyond that. But he says, with a hitchhiker, you're polite and you don't go too far. So if we're going to share the, the gospel or the, the, the uh, too many pages here, excuse me. If we're going to share how to, how to, what is the meaning of the, of the Garden of Eden? And you'll say, well, actually, uh, there's an interesting pattern in Genesis chapter 3 where it, there's two words that God starts out telling Eden about, uh, Eve about, and one of those words is linked down to what God's going to say to the man, and the other word is linked back up to what God says to the serpent. And so when our English translations tell us what the Hebrew is, we need to see those two words so we can see what the links are. And the problem is that some of the modern translations have taken the two words and turned them into a different word. It's just one. So you don't see the links. And so that's uh, helps people that, that actually is leading people to come up with the wrong conclusion. Now they at that point they might fuzz over and you say, okay, it's time to let the let the hitchhiker off. But now they've got an idea. They go, hmm, I wonder I wonder what, what those two words are. Or I wonder what the meaning is if you mess that up, you know. Just so just take them as far as they're able to go. And you know where you're going, but we'll see where they go one step at a time. Don't condemn. So I'm going to go back up to the end of the previous point at the top of the screen here. It's helpful to remember that comprehending spiritual truth is no small thing. Just to grasp the idea of God becoming a man is a mind-wrenching, profound exercise in thought. So if you're sharing the gospel about Jesus, uh, the Son of God who came to earth, was born so that we might have a Savior who could die for us on the cross, <laughs> it's a lot. It's great, and it's, it's simple truth. It's just the basic story, what he did. Let the divine truth sink deeply into the mind and heart of your friends. It may take considerable time. In our church, Paul says, there's a mature woman who's a relatively recent Christian, but has grown like wildfire and teaches Bible classes. She often tells how she didn't really grasp how much of a sinner she was until six months after she had asked Jesus into her heart. So go slowly and let the Holy Spirit lead. Now, step six, don't condemn. <laughs> In the sixth principle, we see that Jesus did not condemn the woman. As she answered his question about her husband, her sin itself condemned her. He didn't bypass the question about her husband's, but he did no finger pointing or head wagging in judgment. In another similar instant, instance with a woman caught in adultery who was brought to Jesus, he said to her pointedly, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. John chapter eight, verse 11. Most of us, Paul says, in either of these situations would have been quick to condemn. It's probably because we have the mistaken idea that if we don't condemn a certain attitude or deed, we will be condoning it. But this was not our Lord's way. So what about people who have Genesis, especially the verse where God talks to the woman later on, she has the name Eve. So when God talks to Eve, a lot of people think that God cursed her or basically cursed her with pain and childbirth. Loose. Where yeah. do they get the Where do they get the idea that the woman was was hit with pain in childbirth by by God? 
Well, that's what most people think. Okay, when they think of this story, that's what they talk about. I would think. You know, where would they, they, they get the first? Because why would they come up with that? Why where would they get that idea? Well, it's a very strange thing, isn't it? Because women, when they give birth, yes, it is challenging for yeah. sure, yeah. and so from their experience and. Mm -hmm. um, because they blame the woman. They know that the woman has eaten the fruit. They kind of remember that as well. But what if they read what if they read this translation of the Bible? Or what if they read this translation of the Bible? Yeah. Or what if they read here's a French one. What if they read this this translation of the Bible? What are they gonna read? What does it say in English or in French? What's it say? I don't know what it says in French. <laughs> 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 but in English, it says pain in childbirth. Yeah, it is not at all. It doesn't say that at all. Uh, the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew, the Hebrew doesn't Hebrew say that. No. no, Hebrew. It is uh, what in, well, theologians have come up with. Okay, but it is not what the original text says. And so, we so here's, are really here's, struggling. Right, so don't condemn. Here's the deal. Um, on face in a Facebook group just this past week, there were all kinds of people talking about Genesis three sixteen, and some a couple people st they started out the thing saying, "I listened to the Eden podcast," and I think they listened to season one, episode one, or episode six, or episode seven. We do it other places too. So they said this is really helpful. I understand now that God said, "I'm going to multiply your sorrowful toil when you dig in the ground that's going to be cursed." So the man and the woman are both going to have that kind of sorrow. And I'm going to multiply your conception. I'm promising that you are going to have, I didn't just warn the serpent that her offspring will crush his head, but I'm promising you specifically, I'm telling you, I'm confirming it to you, Eve, that you will have conception and you will have offspring who will crush Satan's head. So he says, you will have sorrow and you will have conception. Two things. But the sorrow, you know, so they completely misunderstand the kind of sorrow he's talking about. Right. Yeah. And they and they say that sorrow is uh, physical childbirth pain. But the the so the the nice people on the Facebook thread said, you know, I this is really helpful. I understand this now. I'm I I see what God's doing, and He didn't curse me. And He, you know, mm -hmm. if God's going to hit us with extra special punishment, then what's what's he got against women you know what and what do we do and all the theology that we're taught is they're going down a, a false an unnecessary side road that's not even there so but then in that thread there were about 45 comments and most of the people came back and said well actually i think we just have to respect the the big number of translators that have said that uh, it's you know, one thing, I'm going to hit you with pain and childbirth. And then you have to understand that women are, and, then, and they go off. Yeah. And I, I thought, wow. Paul Little says, don't condemn. I, I feel like jumping into this thread and condemning. Did I, I jump, did I, did I, did I jump in and condemn? <laughs> no, no. Uh, you know, the Bible, and scripture does not. That's the truth. And no one knows that, to be honest. You know, not the original text does not condemn. And as you said, there are two um, words here, isn't it? There is sorrow in toil, and, and there is sorrow um, because of, you know, conception and so forth. But they are nothing to do with pain in childbirth. It's not at all related to childbirth. And frankly, how can... Because in the first line, it talks about conception, yeah. eh, of, that, a multiplication of conception. How can you talk about childbirth when you have not even spoken of conception? So right. the, these people on this thread, they were all over the map. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, they're working so hard and they're saying what they've heard. And some people got on there and said, I am a scholar. I have studied this. And uh, there's this and there's that. And there's this pattern. And I thought, well, what am I going to say? Am I going to say actually that that's that's wrong? <laughs> so here here's what I did, Luz. I said I would I encourage you to look at this episode, and I put the link, and I said why don't you go look to season one, 
episode six, and then season one, episode seven. Or get a hold of the of the of the Book of Eden, chapter six, and the Book of Eden, chapter seven. Or go to our 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 uh, our YouTube channel, tru three one six. Type that in and follow follow there. And so a couple hours later, I checked back, and the person who started the thread, oh, I just did episode six. That was very helpful. Thank you very much. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. They actually listen to your counsel, and and then, and, then, and, and she and she said, I, "I, you know, tomorrow I'll I'll do the next one. I'm looking forward to it." Yes. So I and thought then, I don't okay. I could have fought with all these people, and you know, but the mean the meantime, the person who started the thread, she's wondering, and so I just gently said, "Well, there's this." Okay, so let's move next. So number seven, this is what Jesus did with the woman at the well. Stick with the main issue which is what I tried to do. And then number eight, confront the person directly. So Paul Little writes this. And finally, in declaring the Samaritan woman to the Samaritan woman that he was the Messiah, Jesus reached the crucial point of his message to her. I who speak to you am he. I am the Messiah, the promised one. I am God. Oh, what a huge statement. And it was true. Likewise, whether we spend one or many sessions with friends building bridges of friendship, we must eventually cross this bridge and bring the non-Christians into a direct confrontation with the Lord Jesus so that they realize their personal responsibility to decide for or against him. And at that point, uh, people say, well, okay, I'm not a believer. And uh, here's what Paul tells us. I think it's in here. Yeah, he's got these questions. Here's what he does to lead somebody to the Lord. If they're at that point and they realize, I'll just read the top of the page. For a period of time, I used to say to people, are you a Christian? But I discovered that wasn't the best way to go about it for several <laughs> reasons. In the first place, a great many people would say yes, thinking they knew what being a Christian was all about. Soon, I was quite sure in the light of the New Testament that they weren't Christians. But once you get a yes answer to that question, you have a problem. You can't say, well, I'm sorry, friend, you're all wrong. <laughs> for the following reasons. Somehow they don't appreciate that kind of thing. <laughs> People have a right to believe anything they choose to believe, but they don't have the right to redefine Christianity. Only Jesus Christ has the right and authority to state the terms of Christianity. So we, you know, we can say that too. You know, say, well, you might think this thing about the Garden of Eden, but we don't have the right to say, to change the Hebrew words. Mm -hmm. And some people have changed the Hebrew words, but we don't have the right to do that. So now the question, if we're going to share the good news of Eden, what do we do and how did, how did Jesus do it? So Paul Little says, a series of questions I learned from Leith Samuel from Southampton, England, when he was here lecturing years ago, have been worth their weight in gold to me. Here they are. One, have you ever personally trusted Jesus Christ or are you still on the way? And a lot of people, they'll think about that and they'll go, well, that's interesting. And then they, they like to be, you know, it's good to be humble. <laughs> so, so they'll say, well, uh, I'm still on the way. If you have Jesus in your heart, you know what, you know it, you see, you have a, you have a assurance of salvation and you'll say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I have personally trusted in Jesus Christ. But if they haven't, now you've given them a chance, a little insight here. You kind of moved them forward. So then he says, immediately, this question defines clearly what a Christian is. And beyond that, it lets the person know that you're prepared for a negative response without being shocked. It's very common to have a person respond with, you know, that's exactly how you describe me. I'm still on the way. Okay. So you could say, have you ever, have you ever studied the Hebrew words in uh, when, when God talked to Eve? Or is that something you're, you haven't nailed down yet? Yeah, that's something I haven't nailed down yet. Okay. So that's question and response number one. Then number two, that's interesting. How far along the way are you? Paul Little writes, this second question follows up the first one and draws people out more fully. It's absolutely amazing how often I have had people explain to me without the slightest hesitation or embarrassment how far, in the, how darn the, <clears throat> how far down the road of their <laughs> spiritual pilgrimage they are. And that's tremendously valuable information to have. Once we hear them tell us where they are, we can fill in any gaps they may need. Our objective, of course, is to find out where they are to help them further down the road. 
So we can say, that's interesting. How much knowledge of the Hebrew words, of God's words to Eve, do you know so far? And they might they might tell you, well, you know, <laughs> I've got this translation that I like, and I've also noticed that that translation changes it a bit, then I'm not sure about the third line over here. Who knows what they're going to say? And then, Paul Little, and when you're sharing your faith, the third question is, would you like to become a real Christian and be sure of it? And that's like, would you like, so we could say something like, would you like to know what the Hebrew words mean and, and understand the implications of them? Because the problem is, if you think, and this, I was told this in Africa, they said, if God cursed Eve, and they think God cursed Eve and Adam, mm -hmm. but then they're fo they were focusing on Eve. They said, if God cursed Eve, then she must have deserved it. And if she deserved it, and Satan got cursed, the serpent got cursed, and the woman got cursed, then she was kind of like Satan. And if Satan was the tempter and he did led the man into bad things, then Eve was kind of like the temptress and she led man into bad things. Mm -hmm. and, and God put this restriction on the serpent and God put this restriction on the woman and we better put the restrictions, we better watch out for Satan and we better watch out for our women. And they justify patriarchy and abuse and ministry restrictions and all kinds of things based on their misinterpretation of Genesis 3.16. Well, they Other, say, they say of course, the woman made the man to eat. Yeah. So it's her fault. She made him eat. And, you know, we see that in the, the church fathers say that as well. So this is not a new thing. It's not isolated. This is no. a monster problem. Hmm. That's right. And the people who haven't come to Christ yet, that's the majority of people in the world. That's a monster problem. So we want to give away our faith, and we also want to share the good news of, of Eden. And we need to become effective at it. So then the summary here is, these then are eight principles. Meet and know non-Christians personally. Establish a mutual interest in conversation. Arouse a person's interest by life and word. Gear explanations to people's receptiveness and readiness for more. Accept and even compliment rather than condemn. Stay on the track and persevere to the destination. Once we begin to grasp these eight principles and move out in faith, life becomes a daily fascination. We watch with anticipation to see the next opportunities God will give us to bear witness as ambassadors of Jesus Christ and discover how he's working in the lives of others through us. And I think it's really wonderful to be able to talk about, you know, we, we need to correct some of these things. We need to understand better what's going on. And, uh, and we can do that. We can do that. So now I would like to exit full screen here. <laughs> now, this is our first Saturday of, of the month. And there's something else I'd like to tell, tell people about. So it has to do with a picture. Let's see if I can pull it up. The picture is this. A little fuzzy. This is from Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. This lady in the background, is named, her name is Claudine Salenga. And Claudine Salenga was, had moved to Kinshasa, a city of 17 million, with her husband, Nubako, and as a couple, they had been the leaders of a denomination in Northwest Congo for two terms. Then the, there was elections and it was time for another person to take over. And so they were asked to go ahead and start a missionary organization where people from the Congo would become missionaries to other places, Liberia and South Sudan and other places in Africa. So Nubako was often traveling and was out and Claudine is living now in their new their new house in Kinshasa with their six kids. And she said, I'm concerned because the young women in the neighborhood, I hear them, they don't have doorbells in the neighborhood and they have uh, walls. And to get in, you have to bang on the door to get somebody's attention to come and unlock the, the gate. And at two and three in the morning, she was hearing these young women banging on their different, different uh, compounds saying, let me in. 
Well, it wasn't just, a, they didn't succeed only in waking up somebody inside the compound to let them in, but they were waking her up as a neighbor. <laughs> so they wake, and so she thought, what are all these young women doing out late at night like this? Mm. The problem was that lots of these young women were, were living out in the country, up country, and to advance their lives, they'd been sent by the family to come to Kinshasa and live with a relative. The relative already had a whole batch of kids in their own family, plus a problem of underemployment in the city, not enough money to feed the people. Now you've got this shirt tail relative coming in and they weren't being helped to meet their basic needs, food, clothing, whatever. And so these young women had found that there's another way to make money at night selling themselves. Yep. And these were these could have been great sweet young women from you know, this church up country or that you know. And so she she thought what am I going to do? So she and Nubako talked it over and and uh, and she said, "Well, I think I'm going to start with a Bible study." So she started with a Bible study and she had 12 young women that came to uh, their house. And uh while they were there, they studied the Bible because their her number one job was to lead them to Christ, lead them to the Lord. And then to help them grow as a brand new baby Christian, because some did come to Christ. But then she realized they still got this problem. They're still out night. So how do I help them? They need money for food or whatever. She had in her home two of these machines that you see here in the picture. What is that in the picture? Looks like a singer and a sewing machine. That's what it is. And do you notice that where you plug it in? There's no place to plug that one in. Do you see the hand crank? Oh, yes. So this is a hand crank sewing machine. Mm -hmm. So you turn the crank and then the, the thing goes up and down and sews the needle into the thread and the cloth down below. And you'll notice that the uh, the kind of the cloth on the sewing machine and the cloth at the woman's shoulder in the foreground, and then the cloth that uh, Claudine is wearing and the hat that she's wearing, these are clothes that Claudine taught other women how to do, how to make them. Their, she What she did was she started a... Uh, a little program where in nine months, I will teach you how to start your own little business. And you can sew clothing for yourself, but for other people as well. And from the income that you get, you can pay for your basic needs. And so it turned into a 12 month program, nine months in this little school called the Tabitha Center. And then three more months of a stage, what do you call that internship? And, uh, and then a graduation afterwards. And the 12 young women turned into 20 turned into 30, <laughs> turned into too many. They rented a, a building down the down the street a little bit. Uh, and the next thing you knew, some other people said, well, can you start a school over here in this part of town? So we had not just one tap at the center, but they had two, they had three. And now they have 300, 300 of these centers. She's trained them. They have a curriculum, a Bible study curriculum. Uh, they have uh, the sewing curriculum. They had to teach them math. For business math, they had to teach them how to read and write to keep the notes. It's an amazing thing. So I said to them, I interviewed them, by the way, it's on our YouTube channel. And I said to them, uh, how many how many young women have you, have you reached? And they said, 7,000. And I said, 7,000, that's tremendous. In 10 years, you've reached 7,000. They said, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, this year, Bruce, this year we have 7,000. Last year we had 6,000. Others, now we got seven and we'll have more. And they want to, so they've got 300 centers. They want to do more. And I said, wait a minute, pretty soon you're going to have center number 316, right? <laughs> so yeah. he said, yes. I said, we want to sponsor center number 316, of course. I said, what's it cost to, send, to sponsor a center? And they said, well, the, it used to be less. I said, yeah, of course it used to be. But what's it cost now? And they said, well, if we get a certain amount of money, that allows us to buy the, the original equipment, allows us to buy the stuff, to get the teacher, to find the place, to do all that stuff. And at the end of the first year, the money that they make from selling their goods that they made will actually continue to pay and keep the center still running. I said, that's all great. How much? <laughs> and they said, 1800 US dollars. Yeah. And I said, sold. <laughs> but 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 we have to raise it. So this is our goal for this month. Uh, if people would like to help True 316 Foundation launch Tabitha Center number 316, 
and you would like to contribute to the $1,800 goal, you simply go to our website, true316.com slash donate. True316.com slash donate. TRU316.com slash donate. And there's a, there's a slot there for a one-time gift. So you select the one-time gift, you put the amount in there, and you give that. And we'll know. That's for tap at the center number 316. I think it's a tremendous thing. What do you think, Luz? I think it's wonderful. Yeah. 